Hello and a warm welcome. We hope you're having a good day and we hope you're well from where you're joining us. Our session today is about how you can be able to interact with OpenAI models and it will be a very interactive session. So be ready to also type in your questions and we'll give you the responses. I am Bethany Jabchumba, a cloud advocate here at Microsoft, and I'm not doing this session alone. I have Vidushi. Maybe you can introduce yourself. Sure. Thanks, Bethany. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Vidushi. I'm doing my business analytics uh, here at MIT in Boston. Uh, I also graduated as a Google Microsoft Learn Student Ambassador. Um, I'm happy to be here today, take this session, reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have any questions, and I'll be happy to chat with you. Thank you so much, Vidushi. And this session is not the only session that you will be seeing in this series. Before you even go about what the next session will be or what the previous sessions were, there's one thing I need to tell you about, this unique gamified experience, which is the Cloud Skills Challenge. So you can go in and participate in the Microsoft AI Skills Challenge. It's a global challenge, so everyone from all over the world will be participating with you. So I hope you join us in the challenge and see you completing all the modules in the challenge. As I said, this is a series. This is, I think, episode six or seven in the series. And we have been having several sessions in the series. These trainings are guided by subject matter experts and they begin in 19th March, we're in 11th April, and they'll be ending on 19th April. Some of the sessions you might have missed or you might have attended are sessions around the startup, how you can come up with ideas of what you want to build a startup with, then go in with AI and prototype and create a business model for your startup. And then we went into how you can be able to build generative AI models in Azure AI Studio, a bit around from flow to develop large language models, and of course, responsible AI because at the end of the day, we want to be building responsibly and safely. Today's session will be a very interactive workshop where you can be able to learn along with us how you can interact with OpenAI model. This is not the last session. Two more sessions will follow next week around how you can develop a RAG workflow that's ready for production and something on Azure AI such. So I hope you join us then. We're not alone in this session, it's not just myself and Bidwishi. We have Rodrigo on the chat. I think he's already introduced himself. He's a Microsoft MVP and a Microsoft learning expert. He'll be the moderator for the chat. So if you have any questions, ensure you all you post them on the chat. The resources we'll be using for these sessions are two. One, we have the workshop that's live. You can go in there and interact with the workshop materials and get familiar with it as we go along with the session. And then the next thing is a learning path. We will be covering the learning path word by word, but we will be doing a brief overview of most of the things of step in this learning path. So once you're done, you can go ahead and play along with the learning path, learn more and explore more on the topics that will interest you. And as I mentioned, this session is live and we want it to be as interactive as possible. So ensure you drop a hi. I'm seeing a couple of people saying hi. Ensure you also say hi to us. And if you have a question, make sure you ask on the chat. I'll pass it over to Vidushi to get us started with the session. Thank you, Bethany, for this great introduction. Um, all right, let's dive into the session. Let's start with a question. Feel free to leave your answers in the chat or just follow along. Um, so let's think about a time when you when you wanted to build a support application that summarizes text and also suggests code. So you want two functionalities in your app that it should be able to summarize text, but at the same time, it should also be able to suggest code. Uh, can you go to the next slide? So right now with all the AI that we have in our phones and in our laptops, I know every one of us is thinking about ChatGPT. Uh, and so what if we use ChatGPT uh, to build a support application like this, which is really possible, which you can do. Um, and so why would you think of something like ChatGPT is the whole fact that it can take a natural language prompt, essentially a prompt that you just 
say in natural language, which is literally how you talk. And then ChatGPT gives you an output, which is machine, ge which is machine generated because it's generated by ChatGPT, but it's in a human-like response. Like, of course, it just doesn't give you the text. It explains what it is, just like any human would do. So this is why you would naturally think about ChatGPT. Um, but what's the behind the scenes of ChatGPT is the power of generative AI models. So these Gen AI models help with enabling content creation. And this content can vary in different forms. It can be text, code, images, and all of this comes through natural language prompts. Um, like we all know, these days we have a lot of video generation as well as um, generation of images using Gen AI. And so it's essentially just a subset of deep learning, uh, which supports vision, speech, language, decision, search, and all of these uh, umbrella terms, um, all falling in deep learning. And this is because it, it essentially also picks like decisions to understand what the prompt you're saying, and then give you a response which is more human-like. And to use the power of generative AI models, you can leverage Azure's OpenAI service. Um, so what the service does is integrates these gen AI models into the cloud platform, like the Azure cloud platform. And they, as, as always, like every open, like every Azure service, it ensures that it's scalable, it's also secure, and then there's service integration in it. So you can use the developmental tools and the resources that OpenAI ha that Azure OpenAI service has and they're also accessible in multiple ways. So if you have different tech stacks, if you have um, just different uh, prof proficiencies in coding, uh, you can access them via REST APIs or SDKs or the Azure OpenAI Studio interface as well. I think, can you go to the next slide? Sounds good. Uh, so right now, to have the Azure OpenAI service, you need to request an access. And to request the access, this is the link for you. However, we don't need access for this session to play around with prompts. Um, we're going to be giving you a link that's unique to this session. All right. So let's dive into first the basics of like, now that we, you know what generative AI models are, but what are the different types of generative AI models? So. Um, Basically, we have GPT-4, GPT-3.5, GPT-3.5 Turbo. Um, so uh, both GPT-4 and GPT-3.5 Turbo, they can generate natural language and code based on natural language is like the best example I can give right now because everyone's using it. Uh, GPT-4 is the latest generation of GPT models, um, while GPT-3.5 Turbo was optimized for just chat-based interactions. Um, and when I say chat-based interactions, it's more like you can carry out a whole conversation with this model on something. If you give them enough context, then you can keep continuing your conversation. And we'll see this in the later part of the session, how we do that. We also have embedding models, which help to convert text into numeric features. And then we all know we have DALI, which is uh, the generation of images on uh, natural language prompts. And the image you see on right, is the image that Dali generated for me. Um, it's an image when I tell it, like generate a creative image for different types of gen, gen AI models. And so I think it's trying to show you that uh, there are two different kinds of robots in this picture, which act as models. One of them predominantly works on text. The other one's getting creative with trying to create images. Um, so it's very creative, but I just wanted to show you that I put in a natural language prompt, uh, and now we have a really creative image out there. Awesome. Um, can we go to the next slide? Sounds good. And so these um, these uh, Gen AI models that I spoke to you about are all a part of the Azure AI Studio as well. So you can choose which model is appropriate for your use case. Um, select that and then go ahead and build your application or whatever product you were embedding this into. Um, now that we know Gen AI, we know what models we have. Let's also look into prompting for these models because like we know it's going to be natural language, but what are the different kinds of prompts? Um, to, so the, these can actually be grouped into types of requests based on the task that you wanted to perform. So here's the table of 
a few types of tasks that users uh, perform, usually perform. And there's also an example, and a completion example is the response that um, the model gives uh, as as an answer to the natural language prompt that you put in. Uh, I'll quickly run through the table, but I think most of it is something which is um, which like we all know. Uh, inherently, but it's not something that we actually notice. So, for example, uh, we do a sentiment um, analyses on most of our most of the texts. So we classify content essentially. When you say I enjoyed the trip, um, and you ask the Gen AI model for a sentiment, it's going to say that it's positive because of the word enjoy, all of those. Um, then it can also help you generate new content. It can help you generate lists. Um, can also help you generate itineraries these days by telling you where you can go. Um, you can also hold a proper conversation with it. It's a friendly AI assistant, so um, you can ask it, um, all right, I want to talk something about Gen AI. Give me a list of to topics that I can talk. And then you can tell tell the same um, Gen AI model to also elaborate on the topics for you to talk. And then we have transformation, which is translation and symboling counterpart. Go back on the last slide, sorry. Sorry. Yeah, you're good, don't worry. Um, and we can also use it to summarize content. So what a lot of people do is they essentially have large blocks of text, but when they want to um, share it with someone or just give them a summary, it's very helpful for summarizing because it picks the important parts and then provides you a summary. Um, also shows where you left off. Uh, where you left off. So it, you can ask it for a way to grow tomatoes, and then it'll give you um, options of how can you grow tomatoes. And then we can come back on the chat and tell it the progress, just carry out a whole conversation, see how can it, how can it grow better. Um, it, it can also give you factual responses. So for example, how many moons does the Earth have? Um, so just facts and figures as well. All right, can we go to the next slide? Yes. So the completion quality of um, the prompt is engineered, uh, like the response from the model depends on how the prompt is engineered. So the completion quality, which is essentially the response from the model, depends a lot on how well you constructed your prompt. Um, and this is also because, it, and it also varies on the data that this model has been trained on and how well it has been fine-tuned. Uh, you're going to be um, seeing the what the fine tuning parameters are in the next few slides. But essentially just know the better the prompt, the clearer your prompt, the better the completion quality is gonna be by the model. So just remember that. Um, can we go to the next slide? Awesome. So so this, the, this these are all the parameters that essentially contribute to getting a good response from a model. Of course, you don't need to know all of them. It's good to know some of them, um, and you can always look them up when you want to make your own product or a, a Gen AI model. Uh, for now, I'll run you through these quickly. So the temperature is one of the parameters that helps to control randomness. And so that means that how random do you want your responses to be? So if you increase the temperature, it results in more unexpected and creative responses. So. So naturally, if you reduce the temperature, it's going to restrict itself more to how it was trained, uh, more on the data that it had and the fine tuning that it got. Uh, then we also have the maximum length, which is, which is essentially in tokens. Um, so we set a limit on the number of tokens per, the, per response. Um, and so one token is actually four characters in typical English language text. So we tell the model that just give me a response in like at the back end, we tell the model that the max level of uh, tokens should be, that the max level of tokens should be about, let's say 20, 20 or 200. And so it's gonna restrict its responses. They might not be very lengthy and they might not, not be very short. Um, we can also give stop sequences where we ensure that the responses stop at, des at a desired point. For example, at the end of a sentence or a list. Um, then we also have top P, which is very similar to temperature, also conducts, uh, also controls this randomness, but it use, uh, uses a different method. So lowering the top P, P values narrows the model's token selections to likelier tokens. And when I say likelier tokens, you can think about it more as like 
unexpected responses are getting creative, but it's just a new way of controlling this randomness. Then we talk about the frequency penalty, pe penalty, which is that you reduce the chance of repeating a token proportionally based on how often it appeared in the text. So this is to avoid a lot of um, extra words that makes make no sense in the reply, uh, response or to like avoid fillers or uh, words that just can appear too many times. And so you can ha put a pen penalty on these kinds of words, usually like stop words that don't make sense. You can do that. Uh, there's also a presence pen penalty, which reduces the chance of repeating any token that's appeared in the text all so far. So if you want to have a text that's very unique, a response that's very unique, and you want it to cater the audience where it does not repeat tokens over and over again, that's where you can use this presence penalty. We also give a pre-response text, which is more like the text that goes before the user input. So if you think about it, this kind of this text is usually going to be something like, OK, do not have any swear words. Always have polite language. Like this is something that we don't, like a user would not prompt the model for, but it's something that's a pre-response text. And then we have a post-response text, which is um, to encourage the user to continue this conversation. Um, and so the post-response text could something could could end with like, please let me know if you have any more questions, and I would love to answer them for you. So you ensure that your user is also continuing this conversation with you. So all of these parameters, uh, can you go on the next slide? Perfect. And so some of these are repeat, repeated from the um, past slide that we saw. And there's an addition of past messages included, which just selects how many numbers of messages in the past you want to include in the new API request. So what this does is it gives context to the model. So if you were design, if you were having a whole conversation about all right, help me plan a theme party for a birthday of a six-year-old. And then it gives you some ideas. And then you pick one of the ideas. Let's say I want to have it Harry Potter themed. And then you pick out ideas for gifts and outfits and everything. And so the past messages included parameter includes like if it was six or something, whatever unit it has. So it's going to take like six messages from the past, give it to the model again, and then continue this conversation. So the model has enough context. All right, we were talking about Harry Potter, um, Harry Potter themed parties. And so we can continue talking about outfits and gifts and everything else like de de decoration stuff. All right, um, next slide. Yes. All this information, let's do a small recap. We learned what Gen AI was. We show, saw the Azure OpenAI Studio. We also saw the different types of generative AI models. We saw the different kinds of prompts we have. And we saw how we could have better prompts by customizing, how we could customize this Gen AI model with different parameters. Um, we have this playground for you set up, which uh, I think one of the moderators can send the uh, playground link in the chat. Feel free to open the playground. Uh, meanwhile, I think there are some questions in here. Um, let's look at them while they open the playground. I think can you go on the next slide so that they can see what the, what the page looks like? Yes. After you yeah. open the playground, this is what the page should look like. Um, yes. OK, so the questions are already being answered, I guess. How would you explain to users that Genia does not create brand new concepts, but it's based on data and statistics? Um, I think what I would essentially do is like tell people that this is sort of more like brainstorming, and it's built off of the top of some existing data. Like it cannot create new stuff, um, but it can help you brainstorm new stuff. And because that's because it it has a lot of access to data and is fine tuned for it. Uh, I think that would probably be one of the best ways to tell users that you cannot make stuff from here. You can always brainstorm, look into other resources that we have. Uh, could yeah, I can also add that um, I also like to compare AI to a student learning. So you can tell them the same way they're learning in school, the concept, and then they're able to apply the concepts and answer exams. 
the question to the exams are not technically the exact replica of what they learned, but it might be something in relation or an application of what they learned. So that's exactly what generative AI also does. It can be able to, as ML, you can be able to train the model, it can understand and respond to questions. And then with time, it can be able to come up with content based on the data it was being fed. Um, I'm not sure why. Let me share the link on yeah, the chat. Sure. Uh, yes. Give me a second. So we have a new question, which was, um, how can you calculate the cost, which is based off the number of tokens? Can, how can we estimate this cost before the OpenAI deployment? So there are these token calculators where right now what you can do is suppose if you're having your current conversation on ChatGPT, you can just copy paste your prompts and the responses in the token calculator. And this token calculator will give you the number of tokens that you've been using on average for a chat. Um, and it's going to give you both the input tokens and the number of output tokens. And then what you can do is look at OpenAI's pricing, and it's based off the number of tokens. So you can actually evaluate how much, how many calls, and how many tokens do you use on an average, um, and then pick the cost from there. Um, so that's this. Oh, yes. So Sebastian also spoke about how you can find the cost in the doc documentation. Yes, that's very true. Um, all right. Did we send the link here for the playground? Let me let me, let me okay. test on this chat. Yeah. Sure. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 So let's give it a minute. But you sure. can copy the link from. Yes. So now I think the link is up on the chat. Um, you should be able to have the playground show up for you. All right. Um, so I'll quickly give you a run through of what we see here. I think most of us understand that we do have. Um, a user prompt area, which is this this number two, where you actually type in your prompt. Um, we also have a conversation area where you can see all the conversation that you've carried out um, on the, which is the third uh, area highlighted here. On the fourth area, which is the configuration panel, uh, we have uh, the parameters that we can con we can uh, control, and these are the parameters that we spoke about initially in the last two three slides. Um, and then we have function calling on the sixth, which is on the left, you see OpenAI functions, which is the sixth um, area on the screen. Um, so it's basically, you can save your custom functions here to give it some context. Um, I mean, to like put this in layman terms, you could have something like, okay, act as a pizza bot and always respond with the word pizza in, those, in the beginning. Like you can actually tell it to do custom functions. Um, do we have to grant consent to this application? How do we get the access key? Uh, Bethany, can you look into the access key? Yeah. Um, so when you sign up to the application, this is, sorry. This is the window that you will get when you click on that link. You can log in uh, using your GitHub. So it, uh, just logging in using your GitHub credentials, and then you can copy the API key that would be displayed there. And then once you have the API key, you can come in, add the API key. I've already added the API key, so it wouldn't show, but add the API key next to the logout section, and then select a model from the dropdown. Yeah. Oh, uh, why does Dali always misspell words? It's been a hot discussion, I would say. So it's because how, as far as I've been catching up with this discussion, it's really interesting to see how Dali, I think from what I'm understanding in all these discussions, is the fact that uh, Dali is actually trained to be a creative model and it work, works on aesthetics. So it's more worried about the colors, it's more worried about the shapes, but it doesn't, it's not necessarily about words and so it doesn't does does it's based off of aesthetics and not text which is where it's it never has 
it almost never has words that spell correctly. Um, so that's my take on the discussion so far, but we'll see how it goes because I've been also really worried about the Dali images with text. So I prefer to have no text images now. Um, all right. Can we go yeah, to the I think slide? we can. Yeah. Yes. So um, on to the next slide. Yes. So this is how you can start with basic prompting. You can do something like ask it facts, which is like what's the capital of Australia, or solve a math equation or question. You can ask it to summarize text, give it a blog, and be like, OK, summarize this for me. Or you can ask it to write a Python function for you. Um, it can also help you classify text, like we spoke about the sentiment analyses. Uh, and we can also ask for different recipes, right? And then based on this recipe, give me a list of ingredients that I need, make my shopping list, stuff like that. Um, although it cannot perform actions. So you need to remember, you cannot give it the link of a URL and be like, OK, open this URL for me, summarize this page, and give me a PDF of the summary. It won't do the action for you. But if you paste the web page content and be like, summarize this text, that's what you can do it. All right, let's move on. Um, yes, let's go on. OK, so conversation history, we spoke about this. This is the same birthday party theme that I was thinking about. Uh, so you can create a whole conversation. Um, and what what the foundation model is given the whole chat at every, the chat history at every turn. So remember the pre-prompt uh, parameter that we had? It actually, to maintain conversation history, the pre-prompt takes the whole of the chat before, then the new prompt that you're writing, and then gives an output. Uh, so that's how conversation history works. Let's move ahead. OK, so uh, these are a few prompt engineering techniques. These are four of them, which I'll quickly run through. But there's also this Mr. Prompty blog, uh, which I think one of the mo moderators can link in the chat. Um, feel free to check out the blog. The blog is really good and elaborate about how you can prompt engineer well. Let's look into the first technique, which is the zero sh short learning. Um, yes, let's can, can we go on the next slide? Yes. So in zero short learning, we assume that the model has enough information to do the tasks that we're asking it to do, um, and or like the response that we want from it. Like we just assume that the model knows how to do this. So we do not, we do not um, ask it to learn something new, but rather, for example, here we're just classifying. Uh, the text that I just landed my dream job. And so the model already knows. We're not asking it something new. Um, when we go to the few short learning, which is the next slide, there we give it uh, some instances about how what kind of responses are we expecting. So if the user prompt is giving different kinds of email texts and telling that the, this email text falls under the category, category of transactional or business or spam or personal. So we gave four examples to the model, it, very few examples, so few short learning. And then we ask it to give the category for a new email, um, email text. Um, so here, essentially giving it some context to learn and give us a re response. The next one that we have is we break the task down. So we give it enough context. Like I, I gave you an idea about the pizza bot. Here we talk about you're a renowned landscape art architect. And so you are tasked with designing a garden for your new city park. So we tell it that act as an architect and now um, help me with designing this garden. And so we, so the user prompt is, uh, we tell it that it needs to assess the space, also decide on the theme and all of this. So we break the task down for the model so that it can follow one after the other and give us a proper response. Um, can you, yes. So, so, and then the chain of thought prompting is you ask it to give you a step-by-step -step approach. So for example, here we're actually asking the birthplace of Leonardo da Vinci, but we take a step-by-step -step approach. Um, it, we can also ask it to cite sources, which there's not been uh, a lot of success so far. Uh, but if you see, I gave this user prompt and the chain of thought response was this way, where it started with, okay, how do you determine, determine the place birthplace? And then given that this, these were the sources, this is the information that we found. And the final answer is in the very end of the line. So this is chain of thought prompting that we 
ask it to respond in the way it thinks. Yes, um, can we go to the next slide? Yeah, um, I think we've had a brief overview of the different types of prompting, and I want us to test the application path before I continue. So you can see what is the capital city of Australia. Do you know the capital city of Australia, Vidushi? I also don't know. Let's see if it will give us the correct answer. Oh, no, no I knew it. I was just on mute. Sorry. Oh, what is the capital city of Australia? City of Australia. And then I can send it and it will give me it's Canberra. I actually thought it was Sydney because I think that's the only city I know in Australia. But it's interesting, the capital city of Australia is Canberra. So this is a random fact that probably if you Google or you use Bing, you can get a response to. But what about now questions that we might not have, the API might not be trained on? So the thing is, we have to, I'll be discussing four different concepts today. The first one is around context. So most of the time you might ask a question and it doesn't give you the answer you expect because the question may not be clear or the system or the AI system might not be trained to work as you are requesting. So for example, when I asked the capital city of Australia, it gave me Canberra because it's a fact that you can go into the internet and search for. But if I ask a question about what is my name, of course, it won't give me my name because it doesn't know my name. So that, that's where we come in with a system prompt. A system prompt helps you give a guideline or a guidance of what the AI should be able to do. So we have a system prompt here. You're an AI assistant and you respond using rhymes. So you can ask, what can you tell me about John Doe? And it will give you a rhyme. So let's try it out. We can add a system prompt. Let me come here to the system message, change this. And the system prompt is the rhyme, right? So you are an AI people, you are an AI assistant that helps people find information using a rhyme. And I can ask, okay, who is Bethany? Let's see if it will give me a rhyme. Oh dear, I'm afraid I don't know who Bethany person is. I'm not sure. So I'm an AI assistant, knowledgeable and smart, but I can't provide info on someone's hat. If you have another query or need a hand, I'll do my best to help. Just give me a command. This is a very interesting poem. I've never had such an interesting poem about my name, but that's once you give it a system prompt, it can be able to guide the AI into what, how it should respond. This is very useful, not just in terms of giving it guidance, but in terms of responses, but it's also useful when it comes to responsible AI. In responsible AI, you want to, first of all, ensure that when it's giving responses, they are factual, that's where grounding comes in. Grounding ensures it can be able to get data based on the documents or based on the information provided. And then you also want the tone to be polite, interesting, engaging, and not argumentative. And then you also want to look into the user safety. So if someone wants you to give jokes that will hurt people, you say no, the AI system will say no. If it's asking for abusive or bias or discriminative content, AI should also say no. And then the last one is around jailbreak. So jailbreak is when a user wants to use the AI system in a way it wasn't intended to be used. So I'll use an example whereby I want AI to give me financial advice. Before I even ask for financial advice, what I'll need to do is first add in the different prompts. So the first, the different grounding techniques. The first one will be one with response grounding and then two i'll add around tone i'm copy pasting this because of time um so the second one is around tone the third one is around safety you want 
your AI system to work safely, right? You don't want it to be giving people responses on hurtful things and stuff like that. And then you also want it to prevent jailbreak. As I mentioned, jailbreak is when a user comes in and wants to use AI in a, in a way that it wasn't intended to be used. So I'll add that and then update my system message. Yeah, clear that, update again, and then ask a question. So I want financial advice. And I want to know what financial advice do I want? Um, I want to know whether I can buy NVIDIA stocks today. Of course, I, yeah, whether I can buy NVIDIA stocks today or even Microsoft stocks or whichever company you're thinking of. And uh, I ask and it's telling me, I'm not a certified financial advisor, right? So it's already telling me this is general information. This is not information you should cast in stone. It's not information you should use out there, but it's telling you, okay, I'm not a financial advisor, but this is probably information you might want to take stock of when you're thinking about probably investing in stock or something of that sort. I can also go on and ask more financial advice, more, more questions around trying to just still break it or trying to break the safety. And since I already added a system message or a prompt, a meta prompt to prevent this, it will always come and tell me, no, don't do this. I'm not a financial advisor. I can't give you advice on that. Okay, we've learned a bit around system prompt. The next thing I want to introduce is a new concept called RAG. RAG is retrieval argumented generation. Retrieval comes from the fact that it's using user data to come up with data. So it's coming, it's going to your database and coming up with data. And then argumenting, argumenting and generation means once a user asks a question, it arguments both the data it received as well as the user question and gives you a response. How this works is when a user asks a question, as they said, you already have the data aside, so it will query your data. Come in and add the data that's queried to the prompt, then go in and query the, the model or the application, come back with a large language model and send it out. It might be confusing at first, but you might be thinking, how, how, how is this even possible? It works the same way, probably the system prompt works, but more complex. So in this case, let me just ask AI, for example, um, what is the best hiking shoes out there? And when, I resp when it responds, it will give me a general response, right? So if I go to give me the response of Salomon, Marel, Vasquez, Keen, Colombia, La Cotiva, and Loa. Those are the options it's giving me. The very many hiking shoes out there, very different brands, and it's giving me the ones that receive positive reviews. So this is a generalized answer. If let's say for example you owned a retail shop, you had a shop that sells shoes, you wouldn't want people to come in and just get there's this brand, there's this brand that you can use. You'll want users to come in, ask a question, and get responses based on one, the amount of stock that you have in the shop, and two, based on even the pricing or like the quality of the shoes. So I'll clear this and create a new system message. This message, I'll first start with a task, and the task will be. You're an AI engine for the Contoso Trek Outdoor Products retailer, and you answer questions briefly, succinctly, and in a personal manner, probably using Markdown, and add some flair or some emojis because who doesn't want to talk to someone who's using emojis? And then you can also now give your data. So this is a description, the meta prompt for the application, and then you go in and give the data. So these are the documents you can use for this, and I update the prompt. Once the prompt is updated, I'll also look for a customized question that's customized to the prompt, and the question will be, I need warm waterproof shoes to go on a hike. Give me a suggestion. 
And as I said, it should add emojis, personal flair, markdown. Unfortunately, it's not responded in markdown, but the response is short, brief, and the same here. So I recommend our trail walker hiking shoes. Do we have trail walker hiking shoes? Yes, we have a trail walker hiking shoes. They are warm, waterproof, and perfect for your hiking needs. You can find more of this under the product trail hiking shoes. Happy hiking. So if you want to add this into your own application, your own website, it can literally point uh, users or your potential customers to where they can find shoes. Well, you might be asking why exactly do we need to do this? The first thing I mentioned is there's a gap in the knowledge that, that the, mo the model has been trained on, meaning there's some data that it's not aware of. So for example, GPT-4, the cutoff point is September 2021. GPT-4, the 106 preview, the cutoff point is April 2023. And GPT-3.5, the cutoff point is 2021. So it may not be aware of the current, the things that are currently happening. So if you have a prompt, is Queen Elizabeth II alive? It will tell you probably yes, but I am not sure. So let's try it out. Let's try and see if this is actually true. So I'll reset this to default, clear, and then ask, is Queen Elizabeth the second still alive? And let's wait for the response. As of my knowledge cut off, in September 2021, Queen Elizabeth II is still alive. You can also ask other questions. For example, we have the UCL going on today. So you can ask who made it to the quarterfinals. I'm not sure if it's going on today, but I know there was a match yesterday for UCL. So you can ask that. And let's see. Oh, I didn't write the year. <laughs> but yeah, it also gives me the same thing. I don't have real-time information or access to current news. The quarterfinals for the UEFA Champions League vary every season. So for you to find the most recent team, check probably at reliable sports news sources or visiting the official UEFA website. So what if you could add the official, the APIs probably, or what you need to be able to add so that people can be able to see, ah, this match happened yesterday, this was the finals of the match, and probably this is what will happen tomorrow. That's where RAG comes in. And then the last bit is around, it doesn't have access to your own data. We've already tested this. We already tested this. It told us, yeah, we have Salmo, which can help you with your hiking. We have uh, different brands that can help you. But it didn't give us the brand that were in store for us as I mentioned, if you are retail. So, so that's it about RAG. I hope you've learned something new there. The last bit is around function calling. And if you have time, I'll do one final prompt for Dale. Function calling, this was the first time I heard about it, I was confused because I'm like, what, what? I know what functions are, but how are we doing function calling with our Azure OpenAI or even OpenAI? Function calling allows you to be able to get structured responses from the data. It's similar to it's similar to RAG, but with this you can use something like an API or some structured data that you have, and it will come out with structured data. So, for example, you have your AI assistant designed to help users search for hotels. So, if they want help to find a hotel, you call the search hotels function. And this is our function, such hotels. The description is what does it do? It retrieves hotels from such index base. And then you have your parameters here. So you can add as many as you want, as many locations for the hotel. So for example, you can see this one in Seattle, this one in, I don't know which other location, and then add the price. So you can do this. And then once you're done, the required response will be the location, which is Dalmaris, the maximum price, which is 300. So let's try and see. I will also use a blank function and see what it will respond. Uh, so let me clear this and then 
use our blank function. So as I mentioned, the first thing is the task. So what is the AI function doing? And then the second thing will be the function that you want to use. And then update system message. Oh, sorry, wrong place. Mm -hmm. uh, let me read. Uh, so this is a system message. Uh, the function API is supposed to come here. Update system message. Then we add our opening functions. Uh, this is our function name, search, tell, and so on. Then I can come here and I can ask, okay, can I can I book a hotel in the Netherlands? And it will have it updated. Of course. So it helps. No, 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 no. It hasn't updated. Let me save it again. Update this and then do it again. Can you help me book a hotel in the Netherlands? Uh, then let's send it. Let's see. Of course. Yeah, dates of your stay and specific preferences you have for the hotel. And then once you continue with the details and so on, depending on how your function is phrased, it will give you a response just similar to this, a response on, yeah, this is the location of the hotel and this is the maximum price. Okay, I've talked so much. I also want to hear from you. So Vidushi, maybe you can help us yeah with the check, right before we go and have a check i just quickly wanted to remind everyone that i mean she spoke about rag but you you can use rag in your everyday life as well by doing small changes to your prompts like for example let's say you're applying for jobs what you can do is give gen ai your current resume and the job description and you can ask it to highlight parts of your resume to and reword them in a way that it's kind of matches the job description. And so that's like you're giving it additional data, fine tuning the prompt to an extent that you can actually have a better cover letter or a better resume for the job that you're applying for. So, I mean, you can do all of this with like your personal life as well. Like you don't really have to do it as an implemented project and a whole. Um, okay, so because we're running out of time, quickly, let's do just one question. Um, so. The first question is, how can developers optimize the performance of Azure AI uh, models? Um, and you can always leave this, uh, like your response in the chat. If you feel like it, uh, let's go on the next slide and see what the response is like. Let's give them a second to respond. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah. So how can you optimize the performance of your AI model, Azure Open AI model? So do you do that by using complex instructions that are very difficult to understand, or by providing clear instructions that are clear and descriptive, or by using the prompts. So you can respond by just A, B, or C on the chat. Um, as they respond, let me answer some questions on the chat. How can you call external functions, e.g. Azure functions? Um, for this, you would need to be able to add in your, how can you call external functions? You will need to already have your data and everything that you need, and then add in your functions, the Azure functions that you would need, and have the prompt afterwards. So ideally, you will have an environment where you're creating your Azure AI, whether it's Azure Open AI Studio, you add your open AI, whether you add your open AI studio or a Python environment, and then you can be able to use that for responses. Yeah. So yeah, as they mentioned, you need a prompt flow or an orchestrator. They feed whether you're using uh, Azure Open AI Studio, which also uses prompt flow, or an orchestrator like Thematic Kernel and Langchain. You can use that. And then, 
yeah let's let's see the responses for yeah. this question and most of them got it they've said b um yeah um and so yes it's very clear that the more clear and descriptive your prompts are um i mean the better your response is going to be from the model um yes yeah. um all right yeah, um, yeah. So, do we have any we can continue the next question okay. uh, Let's the next question so what we've is the talked about, mm -hmm. yeah go ahead okay so what's the purpose of the system message in a prompt do you remember bethany's putting system messages in the prompt on the left of the playground um so it's is it to give the model instructions perspective or other information to guide its response or is it to give the model a specific answer to generate or to provide filler information to the model? Choose your answer. Yeah. Uh, also, if you have questions, you can continue placing them on the chat. And I've realized a lot of you are having a challenge with the workshop. So let me repeat the instructions again. Um, the workshop will be available for, I think, 30 minutes max after the end of the session so that you can be able to practice and then it will close up immediately. Uh, so th this is the workshop. It starts uh, as a start date is April 8th, which April 8th, which was when I created, but technically wasn't open. And then today is when we've been using the workshop. So it would close by 9.24 p.m. my time, which is a few minutes away from now. And then of course the details of the workshop and so on. So this is the page that you would meet. Initially, when you log into the page, you would have your API key and endpoint. So what you would need to do is, first of all, log in. As you've seen, I've logged in with my GitHub account. So it's telling me, welcome, Bethany Jack. So the first thing you need to do is log in. And then once you log in, you get access to the API key and endpoint. Once you get that, click on the playground and of course, it will ask you to authorize. So once you click on the playground, this is what you'll find. You'll find a text box here where you can add your API key and then log in. You can select the different models. So yeah, I have three models available. You can select any of them and try asking questions and get responses. This is also gives you like the details of the responses, how many tokens you use and so on. And then, of course, the open AI functions, the system message, the chat session, and other configurations that you might need. OK, yeah. so the responses to this question. Yes. So it's so we've got a lot of responses saying, um, no, it's the next question, question two. So we've got a lot, a lot of responses saying it's A, but a few of them are also confused with B. So I'll tell you that the system message in the, uh, the system message that we put in is actually to direct the response to a certain direction wherein like you tell that uh it's it's a pizza board so it needs to talk about pizza it's never to give a specific answer so we actually never tell a gen ai model that always give this specific answer to pe to people it's rather to like give it more perspective yes yeah and the last question yes yeah uh, so it's what's the purpose of providing conversation history to the AI model? I think I'll give you a hint. We spoke about some birthday theme example. Um, so select your option that you think is the best one. I, I, I like the option. So the yeah. first option is um, providing conversational history to an AI model is irrelevant and has no effect on the AI performance. The second one is to limit the amount of input tokens used by the model. And the third one is to enable the model to continue responding in a similar way and allow the user to reference previous content in subsequent queries. That was a tongue twister for me. In subsequent queries, yes. Yeah. So yeah, you can, I'm already seeing responses, a couple of these, anyone else, any other try before we reveal the answer? Let's try. Okay. Let me give the answer. And Vidushi, you can explain. Sure, sure. So, um, so for the conversation history, it's always to like give them more context 
Um, and so the context can help with the subsequent queries. Um, it's never to limit the number of input tokens because you're potentially not limiting any of the parameters. You're not changing any par parameters, but you're just giving it more context. And it's also useful, so we don't consider option A because it's useful to give context because now that it knows that you want a Harry Potter themed birthday party, it will accordingly recommend decor and outfits. Like it's not gonna give Spider-Man options now. And that is because you gave context to the chat, uh, to the conversation, history to the model. Yes, got it. So I think yeah. we have all the questions though. Yeah, um, yeah, I think we've answered all the questions and I don't see any more questions in the chat. Mm -hmm. One thing I, I can comment around conversational history is, have you ever asked, uh, either, I normally use being a co-pilot and ask a question, and then days later, I come back and ask a question based on the question. I don't have to like, always come in and start a new chat, start a new conversation every time. I can just go back and pick it up from where I was and or even track my progress. If I was building an application and I was asking ML questions, I can come back again and use the same. Um, there's one last question before I go to the summary. Can we use Azure OpenAI to create our own chatbot? Of course, you can use Azure OpenAI. There's various ways you can use it. Um, there's one, there's various ways you can use it. So you can use the Azure AI Studio where you'll have access to Formflow. You can use the Azure AI SDK, which you can use, no, the, yeah, the Azure AI SDK, which you can use in various platforms. So if you're using Python, think JavaScript, C Sharp, all this they give you uh you can get access to the sdk and then of course if you want to use other frameworks autogen semantic kernel or launching you can be able to use that yeah and i think that's it for today so some few takeaways number one uh the ai models are here to help developers in your development journey they won't replace developers, at least not from how I've interacted with it. It's here to help you be your co-pilot, not be the pilot. It comes in and helps you be able to come in and guide you in your journey. Secondly, when using models, the first thing you should know is you should be able to give the model an idea of your knowledge level and be able to come in and uh, give examples of what you want. If you want AI to give you ideas of a Harry Potter party, tell it that. Don't ask AI to just give you ideas of a party because it will give you a baby party, it will give you a smart party and so on, but probably when we needed a Harry Potter party. And then when you're going out there and building the applications, ensure you tune your prompt key and sorry, and ensure you tune your prompts, <laughs> then the UI, you've seen how easy it has been to interact with uh, the OpenAI models from here. It's been very seamless. So you should be able to build something that's very user-friendly, very seamless. And yeah, you can go ahead and interact with it. And then the other thing is ensure the model you're using has one the lowest cost, and you can also be able to use the right latency in the right size. So ensure you will dig into the model that you're using, craft it, and be able to build something that's good for your business. Uh, the resources, these are the resources we've shared, the AI skills challenge, ensure you participate, go ahead, learn more. The Learn Life series, this is not the last session. We have two more sessions coming up. So go ahead and learn more on the series. And then for this specific uh, session, we have the new generative AI learning pack. You can be able to continue learning on and the open AI workshop. So you can interact with the workshop. Um, you can interact with the workshop. This is how the workshop is. All the prompts that we use today, uh, the system prompts, all the basic prompting that we use, adding conversational history, so on and so forth. You will find all of them here. So you can come in here and test them out and see 
how you can be able to interact with OpenAI model. As I said, it will be open for only less than 30 minutes after the session. So once it's done, you should be able to have time to interact with the workshop, learn more, and then afterwards, yeah, that will be it. Um, the next session will be around RAG. So I've touched a bit about RAG in terms of giving you an idea of how it's implemented. So you can go ahead and register for the next session if you want to learn more around RAG, if you want to dig deep into what it is. And then if you have any follow-up questions or you want to interact with us, be sure to join us on Discord. Uh, come to Discord, share with us your challenges, all the questions you might have, and we'll be there to answer. Lastly, thank you so much for having us. Thank you so much for joining us in the session. I saw one last question. Um, when should we use Copilot Studio versus Azure OpenAI Studio? So Azure OpenAI Studio is more in terms of a production level application where you coming in and building your applications either from scratch or you building it using prompt flow, having an orchestrator to build your outward facing application. That's when you use Azure Studio. Copilots is, I think, you might have interacted with a copilot in one way or another. Uh, the best place I think I've interacted with copilot is on Teams. So copilot is when you're building in mostly a chatbot that responds based on the data that you have. The main difference between the two is copilot studio is a low code, no code platform. So if you're not familiar with code or you just want to use a low code platform, Copilot Studio is the place for you, but if you want a more technical, uh, code-first approach, uh, Azure OpenAI Studio is the place for you. And I think that's it for me. Uh, yes. Did we see anything from your end? No, I think that's pretty much of what we had. Um, also, feel free to like reach out to us if you have any questions. I myself have been investing a lot of my time tr trying to prompt engineer. Uh, and I'm happy to have a discussion about the different kinds of prompt engineering techniques that I've found work for me, um, especially with this whole resume thing that I've been trying out these days. It's like interesting, like it blows my mind sometimes. So feel free to chat with us. Um, come say hi anytime. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone, and have a great day. Bye. Bye-bye.